This is Work Lab. I'm your host, Elise Hugh. On Work Lab, we hear from leaders and scientists about the surprising data and trends that are transforming the way we work. This season, we have interviewed Microsoft executives and researchers. We've talked with behavioral economists and experts on diversity, equity, and inclusion. We've heard from social scientists and meditation guides. Each of them has given us a different perspective on the ways in which hybrid work has radically changed our lives and insights and tips for managers and employees to navigate these uncharted waters. Today, I'm joined by the podcast's correspondents, Desmond Dickerson and Mary Melton. Desmond is a Microsoft employee who works remotely out of Atlanta. And Mary is a journalist and editor who works for Godfrey Dadage Partners, the company that produces this podcast. Hey, Desmond. Hey, Mary. Hi, Elise. Hey, how's it going? Well, it's going good, and it's the final episode of the season. So we're kind of looking back. And I'm curious, for y'all, what were the themes that really stood out to you? Right off the top, the great mm-hmm. reshuffle. The great <laughs> reshuffle is something we heard just again and again and again. And we should note that we call it the great reshuffle on purpose and not the great resignation, which you've probably also heard. Yeah. And, you know, that stood out to me as someone who actually participated in that, you know, and left one job and joined another mm-hmm. in the midst of all of this. There are some numbers on just how many people did do this reshuffling, right? Right, right. So earlier this year, Microsoft did a survey and 41% of the folks that they surveyed said that they may leave their employer at some point over the next year. Uh, And then that really bore out by the time we got to September. I've got the data here. The U.S. Bureau of Labor Statistics in September alone, they said that 4.4 million workers reported leaving their jobs. That is a record. And the month before was 4.3 million. It's wild. I think that's why a lot of people are calling this the great resignation, right? Like, because so many people have resigned, but we really like the term the great reshuffle because it connotes transition, something that's positive, hopefully something that leads to something new, which is, you know, a little less bleak than the resignation. Yeah. Instead of a fixed end point, like just leaving. (laughs) (laughs) Exactly. Wow. And in our first episode, the Microsoft Corporate Vice President for Modern Work, Jared Spataro, pointed out that the impact of the pandemic on our psyches has been enormous. We have certainly felt it individually, felt it collectively. Um, And it's actually not unlike the Great Depression or a world war. People are rethinking where they spend their time and how they spend it. They're exploring these big existential questions. And they're also, you know, exploring things that they have to do because they hadn't had to do them before, right? There's a lot of uh, reshuffling going on by necessity. And something that we explored, Mary, was just how sort of unequal that this pandemic was in terms of how it hit us, right? Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, we're we're exploring these big existential questions about our careers, and that's kind of a privilege to be able to do mm, that, yeah. right? But we also are exploring these ideas because we had to. The pandemic really hit frontline workers really hard. If you have kids, if you ha- if you're taking care of anyone who's older in your house, like you didn't have options about about daycare, right? And so a lot of people had to leave jobs because they just had to because they had to stay home with their kids. So there's also some real um, inequality here, and um, and also. Also, the digital infrastructure piece of this, right? That's a huge deal. A lot of people just didn't even have the tools at home that they needed in, to enable them to work from home. Yeah. There was a flip side to not going into the office, though, too, right? Because there were others, a lot of folks who found they could be really productive at home, despite the distractions of everyday life. That's a lesson I learned years ago. I've been working from home for <laughs> about five years now. So that's, you know, something that works for me. You know, people talk about the distractions of everyday life, but there's distractions at the office too. And there's folks stopping by your desk or there's, you know, some sort of celebration down the hallway or whatever is going on or just the miserable traffic that you have to sit through in, in most of the cities where these types of jobs are. Right, right. On the flip side of that, There's a lot of folks who have said in surveys, and just we know this anecdotally, that we miss the bonds created by working in person. Like I miss when somebody stops by my desk and says, Mm -hmm. do you want to go to lunch or do you want to go get a coffee and we'll walk to a coffee? 
Yeah, I've been working at home for four years too, Desmond. And um, I did find myself in this odd position at the beginning of being kind of the sage in the office of telling everyone how, <laughs> how to do this, right? Since I was used to it. But you you never really let go of, of some of those things that you really miss, you know, those connections that you make. And also just the serendipitous nature of being in an office and falling into conversations that you wouldn't have otherwise or being able to express yourself about something that you're going through. There's a lot to be said for keeping those bonds strong that you have in person. Right, right. This idea that you're talking about, about how we want to work from home and there's a lot of productivity gains from it, but also we miss being around our coworkers is something that Microsoft CEO Satya Nadella has been calling the hybrid paradox. Microsoft took a survey of 31,000 employees in 31 countries and found a similar and really high number of people want to work from home, but also want to work at the office. Many folks are seeking out jobs that can give them both. And Dr. David Rock, who we spoke to this season, he is the co-founder and CEO of the Neuro Leadership Institute. He breaks down this fundamental challenge. What we found from our data and from the science suggests basically a third of people really want to work at home because that's where they're most productive, not because they want to go off, but actually they do their best work there. Those people being forced back in feels like punishment. It's like, you know, on the one hand, you're telling me to work hard. On the other hand, you're making it hard. And, you know, I got my life back, you know, when I was working at home. So why are you doing that? But there's another third of people who are just polar opposite. They're like, if you make me go home and work, it's like suspension from school. I can't get anything done. I hate it. People are really passionate on both sides of this. And it turns out both groups say the reason is because that's where they're most productive. And then you've got about a third who say they're most productive actually mixing it up. First of all, I'd like to just say, how cool of a name is Dr. Rock? Like that just sounds so, <laughs> <laughs> so authoritative. <laughs> Yes. The, the point that he makes is one that we've been grappling with throughout this season. And as we arrive at the end of this first season, there are no concrete answers, but we know it is that last is choice C of what Dr. Rock mentioned. It's a mix, mm -hmm. right? And figuring out how to best mix it up or give employees flexibility in making those decisions. Yeah. Yeah. And, you know, you were mentioning managers just a minute ago, and I think that Managers have never been more important um, in how they figure out how to manage their team, how to, you know, give their team some agency, Absolutely. but then find what works for each and every, you know, individual on the team. Um, it's it's a key time. You know, those are the folks that are going to make employees feel welcome and feel like their work is meaningful uh, and, and keep them from, you know, exploring other options and moving out. So this is the time for organizations really to invest in their managers and making sure that they're trained in the right way, uh, not just to lead teams, but to understand, like, how do you lead teams in this new way of working? That hits directly on something else I remember Dr. Rock saying, which is how people are trying to increase their sense of autonomy. So many things felt so out of control in the last few years. And managers can really help foster that sense so that employees feel like they have power over their choices, right? Uh, underlying all of this is the buzzword of the year, which is flexibility. Uh, that word came up probably more than any other this entire season. Mm-hmm. A LinkedIn survey showed 81% of leaders are adjusting their policies in order to offer greater flexibility. And why? because they're responding to workers. 73% of workers say that job flexibility is their top priority, and that surprised Dan Roth. He was one of our guests this season. He is the editor-in-chief of LinkedIn. And we see this in all of our data at LinkedIn, is there is this incredible demand for the ability to be able to carve out your own path and to have flexibility. We've done these kind of surveys before, and you, it, it was always like, hey, what's a priority for you as a worker? It was always pay and recognition. In the pandemic, job flexibility shot instantly to the top and it has stayed there. On the same episode where we talked to Dan Roth, uh, I talked to a friend of mine named Tammy, 
he has a job at Microsoft and this is his day job. So he's doing very technical stuff, technical sales. But outside of that, he's doing very creative stuff with photography and videography and storytelling. And he's just really growing with the outside stuff within the creator economy. And then he leveraged that and brought it back to work and said, hey, you know what? I want to switch to marketing. I want to do more creative stuff. And it was just that smooth transition for him. Yeah, it's very cool. And Mary, the Work Lab digital publication actually has a story from Jared Spataro highlighting the top 10 words and phrases that defined the work trends of 2021. Tell us, what was the upshot of that? Yeah, Jared touches on things like hybrid paradox and the great reshuffle. And he zeroes in on flexibility, naming that the word of the year. And that makes sense because we've seen not only flexibility on how we work and where we work, but also in how we're thinking about, as Desmond just said, flexibility in what we're doing. People are rethinking how they can bring their side hustles into their day jobs, maybe, or focusing more on being a part of what's been called the creator economy. Uh, People have dubbed it a hyphenate culture because you're not just one thing, you're many things. So that's just a very different way of identifying who you are. Yeah, it's a very LA lifestyle. (laughs) Like you'll find somebody who makes some sort of food product for the farmer's market, but also is an architect and also has a screenplay, you know? And so it seems like that whole ethos is very now. Yeah, I love that this is being adopted on on a much wider scale. It just is such a more exciting way about thinking about your prospects and about who you are uh, and and, and broadening just the the definition of, of what makes you you. And corporations are really having to work with employees in order to offer them the flexibility that they're looking for. Flexibility is a major factor in Microsoft's own management framework, which is called Model Coach Care, which we talk about a little bit on this season. And Microsoft's Corporate Vice President for Talent Learning and Insights, Joe Whittinghill, talked about why that's become so important to managers. So during the pandemic, we've really asked our managers to lean in on model coaching care. We've asked them to model the behaviors that we need to create inclusive and connected teams and model our culture. We've asked them to coach their teams, not only on being productive and getting work done, but on how to stay healthy and stay connected with each other and continue to learn and grow. And most importantly, we found during the pandemic that care was critically important with their teams and to really meet with their teams individually and ask them how they were doing and to be empathetic to what the needs of those individual team members were and to find ways to create as much flexibility as possible for them in order for them as individuals, as a team member, and then quite frankly, as the company to be successful. Yeah. This is not only important for retention, but it's also important for the bottom line is what he was saying. Yeah. I started a new gig in the midst of all of this, you know, earlier this year. So as a part of the great uh, reshuffle Mm -hmm. and before I even started, like a couple of days before I started, my boss called me and he's like, Hey, you know, I just went through this process and like, these are the challenges. These are the roadblocks. Here's what I learned. Um, So this will smooth it out for you on Monday, do X, Y, and Z. And I was just hanging out. I was on vacation at the time. Um, But to get that call and to have that care before I even started, and it truly did make a difference. Like things were smooth the following week. Like that's what leaders have to do. That's what managers have to do. When I join the team, I already know, oh, this person has my back. You know, they've got my best interest in mind. So I'm going to, I'm going to make it work. Yeah, this is really complicated terrain for managers right now. I mean, it's complicated for everyone, obviously, for employees, for for everyone, you know, but for managers to really figure out how to really keep an eye on folks and to know how they're doing uh, when they actually aren't seeing them every day. That's really difficult. I, I think about this is from a parenting point of view. Like I can't imagine parenting from a distance, right? Like how how, how to do that. So how managers are, are, are navigating that and, and learning new things along the way, uh, you know, being patient, hopefully with themselves too. It's a huge question. But also exciting, right? Because it creates some opportunities to make our workplaces better, um, to really take care of the employee in a holistic way in a way that maybe was really devoid from work culture 10 years ago mm-hmm. or, or yeah. even more recently in some places. Yeah. 
Anne Helen Peterson talks a lot about this. She is a culture writer, a long time at BuzzFeed, and now on her own, writing her own newsletter. And she writes so well about work culture. She's even co-written a new book on the subject. Her take on manager empathy was really insightful. So much of management is actually listening. Like I think sometimes we think of management as your ability to talk to other people when really it's a lot more of that invisible labor of listening and not just like nodding your head and and not speaking, but hearing what the person is saying and asking the sort of follow-up questions that allow people to understand what's actually going on. I'm going to ask you a question this time, Elise. Sure. You're a mom. Mm-hmm. What have you learned about being a good listener uh, from parenthood? Like my biggest parenting insight is that the things that we try to really recognize when you're parenting small children, which is that kids just really want to be seen. They just want to be heard and seen. Mm -hmm. It's actually true for everybody. Like it's true for adults too. And we sort of lose that, I think, um, in dealing with our friends or our peers, um, our coworkers. But I try to sort of think about that and bring that to my relationships, which could also be really useful in the workplace. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, we were talking earlier a little bit about what we miss about being in an office and those Mm -hmm. interactions that we have with our coworkers, when we can just check in with each other, or we can just tell someone's feeling a little down, or maybe had a hard a hard night with their kids, or or having a, a hard morning, right? Mm-hmm. And you don't feel as necessarily as safe to be as uh, transparent with that. So right now we're going through a life change in, in my family, where my mother in law, who was very ill with COVID on the East Coast, hospitalized for a month, rehab for six weeks. We're actually moving mm. her out here now to be closer to us, and this is a big change in our life. It'll be a big change for us. And it's the kind of thing I would probably be chatting about with my colleagues, right? If I was seeing them. And you don't want to be that person at the beginning of the virtual meeting who's like, well, I'm not feeling so great, (laughs) right? So like mental health and and wellness is a huge factor right now and and checking up with each other and being patient with each other. And how do you do that when you're not actually seeing each other? Yeah, Microsoft's been doing some interesting research around that concept. So they've been exploring this idea of what we call mindless chatter, right? So those little conversations that you have before a meeting Mm -hmm, or after mm -hmm. a meeting, and then through that, you know, just studying that, they've been able to see how powerful it is just to reframe it and not think of it as mindless chatter, but mindful chatter. Mm. Uh, And that really just emphasizes how important, how meaningful it is to have those conversations. You're talking about your family or whatever's going on with you uh, outside of, uh, you know, office hours. And it really draws people in. It helps to enhance those ties, you know, enhance those bonds that you need to do innovative work and creative work together. Yeah. And what you mentioned, Mary, about how wellness and mental health really need to take priority in a time where we don't have the same assumptions that we used to have about being able to kind of feel somebody's energy in the same room is really, really important. And, you know, we talked about this a little bit earlier, too, but that some groups have done better than others with hybrid work. And there's a lot of reasons why that's the case. Mm -hmm. And Desmond, you spoke with someone, when Gooey McKelvey at Microsoft, who talks about this, right? Yeah, yeah, absolutely. You know, she was talking to me about why she thinks that, you know, female and black workers in particular are embracing new ways of working and how we think that it's a trend that really deserves a little bit more attention. You're not worrying right now about like missing out on like the group lunch or the water cooler discussion or being invited into a room. It has allowed relationships to flourish in a way because everybody's looking for connection now. You're not just going to go to your safety net of friends that sit next to you in the office. Now you have to be intentional about actually establishing relationships with people. Now, I think with hybrid, you're going to see more and more people wanting to come together and maybe not so much in these sort of siloed ways, right? It's going to be very intentional about how you bring people together um, in very intentional ways. It's opened up a great opportunity for people to have some of these connections that they probably wouldn't have had before.
Yeah, I love that she mentioned intentional Mm -hmm. and intent because that word really feels like a close second to flexibility as a buzzword this year. And also, you know, communicated that as we were saying before with Ann Helen Peterson that why it's so important to listen, how managers can really glean so much from just listening to what their employees want and looking for ways to establish new norms and ways of doing things and being ready to, again, be flexible, right? To change when you get the new data that shows that something's working or that something yeah. isn't working. Mm-hmm. So speaking of intentionality, I think that if business leaders are very intentional about how they're building their workforce in this hybrid era, it's just going to unlock so many more opportunities for innovation and creativity and new ways of thinking. So, you know, now women workers or black workers or, you know, even folks that have disabilities or chronic illnesses, for whatever reason, they may not have thrived or enjoyed that office environment. But now that everything is open to everyone to, to create new relationships and new ways of working, this is the time when those those folks can make huge investments uh, and, and huge impact on the way that we're all working. And businesses should be intentional, not only in how its managers and employees behave, but also in how they hire, right? There's McKinsey research that shows the big companies in the top quartile for ethnic and cultural diversity outperform those in the bottom quartile by 36%. This season, we spoke with Rithu Basin. She's an expert in diversity, equity, and inclusion. And she outlined what she sees as the best way forward for managers to support employees. We have been shaken to our cores around how are you going to lead? And so being intentional, being mindful, being vulnerable, being authentic, being flexible, cultivating a mindset of growth and agility over constantly um, aiming for perfection, which doesn't exist, but doing your best takes on a whole heightened level. And so as a leader, as a team member, your imperative is to be as intentional as possible in how you lead, offer team members choice and flexibility. And then perhaps the most important piece for me as it relates to DEI is that ensuring that you are taking proactive measures to integrate and support those who choose to work primarily in a remote way. There was also a tip, I think, about finding a buddy or sort of assigning buddies for any new employees or even established employees, you know, so that you kind of have somebody to go to that might not be your manager. Um, What other tips do you all recall about making people who are working remote feel included? Yeah, I think when you're on a virtual meeting, as I mentioned before, it's hard to read people sometimes. Mm. And if someone's really seems to be a little bit off, listening to them is really, really important and following up. Yeah. Uh, and that's, again, something where if you were in an office, maybe that would be a little bit easier to do. Mm. I'm just going to go drop in on their office. Yeah, absolutely. Frequent check-ins are essential and managers should be keeping track of employee well-being as well as progress on projects. There have been challenges, though. Microsoft conducted a global survey of workers and found that 54% feel overworked, 39% feel exhausted. Managers can and should be doing more to support employees who are struggling or are simply stressed out. Earlier in the season, we talked to Claire Purvis from Headspace on why it's important for workplaces to be more responsive to the mental health needs of their employees. We're starting to see a shift slowly but surely to the idea that actually just as we eat vegetables and go for walks and, you know, do things to care for our physical health, we can actually engage in different skills that help us take care of our emotional health. And this is all creating a conversation that, you know, centers on this theme that actually mental health is is real. It's something we all experience and it's something that we have some agency um, to manage. We were joking about like how soon it gets dark, how early it gets dark, um, but that that's real, you know, and it yeah. has true impacts on your mood. Uh, you know, it was a seasonal affective disorder. Yep. As as she said, there are different ways that you can work around it. So maybe that's taking a walk during the day while while the sun is still out, um, so that you've kind of you know stretched your legs and, and got a little energy and uh, built yourself back up as as you have the opportunity before it got dark. Are either of you doing any meditating? 
Yeah, I start out my day with the meditation, and I also huh. took very seriously your conversation with researcher Michael Bowen uh, on this season, Desmond, when he, he talked about mm. the scientific mm-hmm. reason why our brains do need a break. A Microsoft researcher really, like the, the data shows that we need that. So in addition to a, a morning meditation, I purposefully take breaks throughout the day. I love that. I'm not doing as good with my morning meditations, but I'm I'm big on the breaks. Like, and not just, hey, let me stand up and stretch my legs, but I go outside. I stand back on, on the veranda and, you know, soak up some fresh air, try yeah. to get into the sun if I can. Uh, you know, these are the things that I do that really break it up and makes me feel like I've gone a different place. I've stepped out of this virtual world and fully immersed myself into the true, you know, real physical world. Love that. I'm just curious, are there any other takeaways from the season that you have put into action? I had a huge one with Dr. Mm. David Rock. He had so many great actionable right. <laughs> tips. He did. Yeah. I mean, he just was just a, 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 just a font of them. And the one that really stuck with me um, and I put into action immediately is a company I work for, Godfrey Dadish Partners, the partners on, on producing this podcast, we had this standing morning meeting that I felt like was mostly to talk about things that we should be doing if we weren't actually having a meeting talking about the thing we should be doing during the meeting. <laughs> <laughs> so I immediately called a meeting, of course, to say, can we not have this morning meeting every, every morning and instead maybe you know have a, a, a status doc that we just update? And this really immediately helped me gain back, I swear, a month of my life and not just my life, but of all of my colleagues' life where we were having this meeting. Wow. So everyone listening should go back and listen to that episode with Dr. Rock. But here is how he framed it. And clearly it was really persuasive to Mary. Uh, We call it minimal meeting Mondays and minimal meeting mornings just because they're fun alliterations. You know, if you leave Mondays and mornings open for people to do their own work, they end up doing amazing work, much better work, because that's the time your brain's most creative. That's an example of a, you know, an organizational-wide practice you can do that can you know, really help people with that, you know, that road rule. Uh, love it. And think about doing that, too, in your own workplaces. Yeah, yeah. If your Monday meetings aren't as productive as you, as they were intended to be. <laughs> So I'm not doing it on Mondays, but I I really enjoy my Freedom Fridays or my free time Fridays, uh, where it's pretty much no meetings. And, you know, it's really a good time to reflect on the week that you've just had, you know, knock out some things that you may have overlooked and then prepare for the week ahead. And then, you know, an hour or two of just really thinking deeply and creatively about what's going to make a difference. Like, where can we have a breakthrough? Are there any other moments that you'll remember or insights from conversations that were really practical for you or just kind of personally amusing? Yeah, I have one for this. Uh, It was in the first interview I did this whole season with Jamie T. Van, who's just Mm -hmm. a brilliant Microsoft researcher. And we were talking about something that she calls the leaf blower problem. Mm. I'm guessing we're all probably (laughs) familiar with this. Uh, You're in this really nice, calm, virtual meeting, and then there's suddenly a very loud, unexpected racket in the background. But the leaf blower problem is not just that noise. It's the fact that you turn down the the speaker, you go unmute on your side, but the people on the other side, they don't know that you're still hearing that noise. And that's actually the leaf blower problem because they can't tell that you're still reacting to something that's going on in your environment. And that's something I'd never really thought of. Uh, But of course, as we were discussing the leaf blower problem, a leaf blower came into my neighborhood and we had to stop the recording. (laughs) So it was just a little too meta to have something so relatable like that happen during the podcast. Yeah, (laughs) that's that's so on the nose. That's how it goes. Yeah, it's it's like a conspiracy. (laughs) Desmond, any last word from you? Yeah, it's just been a fantastic season. Lots of wonderful guests. And I'm very much looking forward to, to the next season and chatting with even more experts about the future of work. Fantastic. So are we. I think that's a great note to end on for this season. Thank you both for helping wrap up what was an awesome first season with your insights and your funny stories. Thank you, Elise. We learned a lot this season. Thank you. That's it for this episode and this season of the Work Lab podcast from Microsoft. Check out the Work Lab digital publication, too, where you can find, among many other things, a transcript of this very episode. That is all at Microsoft.com slash WorkLab. And for this podcast, we'd love it if you could rate us, review, and follow us wherever you listen. We will be back next year with more great interviews and insights on the future of work. 
The Work Lab podcast is a place for experts to share their insights and opinions. As students of the future of work, Microsoft values inputs from a diverse set of voices. That said, the opinions and findings of our guests are their own, and they may not necessarily reflect Microsoft's own research or positions. Work Lab is produced by Microsoft with Godfrey Dadich Partners and Reasonable Volume. I'm your host, Elise Hugh. Our correspondents are Mary Melton and Desmond Dickerson. Sharon Kalander and Matthew Duncan produce this podcast. Jessica Volker is the Work Lab editor. Thank you all for listening.